Hello my friends, welcome to my corner. I have a book review for you today. I wanted to talk about Nathalie Sarot's Tropisms, which I have just read. This is a very, very short book, but I cannot promise you that this is going to be a short video, so we'll see how that uh, happens. Uh, at the risk of stating the obvious, right, let's begin with this. Nathalie Sarot was one of the leading figures of the Nouveau Roman movement, right? And as you know, this is this was an iconoclastic movement that tried to demolish, I would say, the traditional novel, the 19th century novel, basically. If you want a manifesto for the uh, Nouveau Roman movement, one of the books that most people mention most of the time is for a new novel by Alain Robe Grillet. So that is one of the most well-known texts on the theory behind the Nouveau Roman. But something that not many people say is that Nathalie Sarot had her own manifesto of the Nouveau Roman titled The Age of Suspicion. So you might also want to check that out, especially if you want to read Sarot's fiction, just to see what she says. As you know, manifestos are very problematic texts. You uh, wonder who is the author of the manifesto speaking for, right? Is he or she speaking for him or herself? Are they speaking for the whole movement? And of course that poses a lot of problems, right? But they're still interesting to read, I would say, manifestos, right? So I, I, you know, I sometimes read those just to get a clearer idea of what their aims and their purposes are in terms of the books that they publish. So, uh, Tropisms was published in 1939. Okay, so just to give you an idea of the context, speaking also about the Nouveau Roman, um, Alain Robb-Grillet's novel, uh, The Erasers, which is also a very important text of the movement, was published in 1953. So we're talking many, many years later. And then uh, Molloy by Samuel Beckett is from 1951. So just to give you an idea of, of the texts that were important for the Nouveau Roman, Claude Simon, who is also sometimes associated with the Nouveau Roman, although they say that he's different, but you know, they're all different if you ask me, but that's what the, the critics say. His first novel, which not many people read and is actually not even available in English, uh, The Trickster, Le Tricheur, if you pardon my pronunciation, is from 1946. So that gives you an idea of the context in which tropisms appeared. Uh, it really is a foundational text. Okay, this is really a cornerstone of the Nouveau Roman. So if you really want to explore that movement, uh, you know, uh, this is really a very, very important text. So what is tropisms? Okay, basically what we have here is a collection of 24 vignettes. They are really independent vignettes. Okay, uh, we cannot even speak of a mosaic here. There is no plot, but they do not even form a mosaic, uh, unless, of course, you're, you say something like, okay, they are, they are a mosaic of the human condition, but I, I think that's kind of a, you know, that's kind of cheating if you say something like that. There are many characters in the tropisms, but they, they are not named. Okay, so we have a very disjointed text, and the characters do not recur. So I believe the author, the narrator in this case, really wants to make sure that we see these vignettes as independent texts. Each one is a separate uh, tropism. So that, that is very, very important. Let's look at a definition of tropism. Okay, since we are talking about a, this specific term, a very specific term, uh, especially in the context of literature, uh, let, what, what is a tropism? What is, does that mean? Right? So let's go back to biology uh, class. And uh, I, I'm a fine one to talk about this because I, I had to drop biology, okay? I, I was awful. I was studying like crazy and I was still getting D's and F's. So and, and anyway, you know, let's not even go there. So the definition of tropism that I have is that it is the turning point, okay? The turning point of all or part of an organism in a particular direction in response to external stimulus, okay? So we have a very, very specific definition here, and in a prologue to, to this little book, Sarot actually defines what tropism means to her. And she calls these things that we read here, these vignettes, movements. Okay? Movements written under the impact of an emotion, she says, okay? of a very vivid impression. So we start with an emotion, we start with a very vivid impression, and that's how we get to these tropisms, these movements, as she calls them. So 
what I, I would call them, and here I'm borrowing a term, borrowing and adapting also a term from Virginia Woolf, is moments or movements, if you will, of being. Okay, so we have pure being in a sense, you know, things that happen, not necessarily uh, meaningful things. And many years ago, I read, and I, I wish I could tell you where I read this uh, or who the source for this is, but for the life of me, I do not remember. Somebody described the world of the Nouveau Roman novelists as a world that is neither meaningful nor meaningless. It's just there, right? So neither meaningful nor meaningless. It just exists, if you want to put it that way. Now, I don't know if you can really apply, it sounds really good, right, as a description of the Nouveau Roman, but I don't know if you can apply that to tropisms, really. I mean, if we're talking about texts that are the result of an emotion, right, or a very vivid impression, what these texts are saying, maybe in an indirect way, is that there is more to things than meets the eye, right? There is more to these ordinary day-to-day -day, uh, moments and occurrences than we realize. So uh, that means they're meaningful in a way, right? So, you know, uh, I take that with a grain of salt. I think it's a very good description maybe for the Nouveau Roman as a movement, you know, as a literary school, if you want to call it that. But maybe for tropisms, it's a different story. And Nathalie Sarot said that her entire work, her entire body of work, her whole like uh, approach to, to narrative was contained in the tropisms. So it, it is really a, a very important text that we have here. What are these tropisms about? Okay, that's a question that, that would arise. The first one, just to give you an example, focuses on women strolling around the streets with their kids looking at shop windows. Okay, so, and that's it. You know, we have a description of that. It's a very special description. When I describe it, it doesn't really mean anything, you know, but we, we get these movements, these feelings and, and impressions about that. And that is all that happens, right? As I said before, there, there is really no plot here. In another one of the tropisms, you have a juxtaposition of conversations of a woman, between a woman and the cook. And in the other room, you have her husband's private musings. So you have two things happening at once. Very interesting how uh, Sarot sometimes does that parallel parallelism between you know things that are happening simultaneously, and and all that. Uh, let me mention others that that uh, you know were meaningful to me. Number five, for instance, is about a woman who remains motionless. So there's this sense of motionlessness in many of the tropisms, and a sense also of quiet desperation in several of them. Number six, I also liked. It's about a housewife who sees things or objects as her source of power. So it's a very interesting way in which she, she comes to see, you know, the, the objects in the house as her uh, source of power. I also liked number eight, which uh, tells you about a grandfather who likes to remind kids of his mortality. It's a little bit cruel, um, but, but I really liked this, this little moment that is described. Number 10 was also very good. It's about women who go to tea rooms and they gossip. Okay, so we have very, very ordinary things, very mundane moments, but that, you know, you can tell that below the surface there is something going on there at a much deeper level that maybe the characters, of course, do not realize, and that maybe, you know, uh, strikes us at, at different levels ourselves. You know, everybody's going to get something different from these tropisms. There is not, uh, like, a key or, or a clue to them. Number 11, I also uh, wrote down, is about a woman who uh, is ironically described as a parasite because she enjoys literature, like serious literature. So it's a woman who carries out the role that is expected of her, but secretly she is a reader. You're going to see a lot of that in the tropisms, this idea of the expectations that people have of women, right? So that is a huge dimension of this text, and it's a very rich text when it comes to that. Number 15 is another one that I really liked, and it's about a girl who says she enjoys the company of old gentlemen because with them you can really talk about things, that's what she says. But then things take an unexpected turn in this tropism. In a few of them you're going to see that something happens that, that marks a little bit of a turning point. Not in all of them, okay? This is not really common in the tropisms. Most of the time they are rather, you know, static moments. But in some of them, and this would be an example, you have, you do have those turning points. Number 18 is about an elderly lady who is awaiting tea time. That's it.
okay this one is brilliant I would say that number 18 is probably one of my favorites because it's so brief they are one page long two pages long the longest must be you know around two and a half pages or three pages long so they're brilliant brilliant moments uh, another one that I liked is number 19 which is a really dark but powerful meditation on child rearing and finally the last one that I wanted to mention is number 22 which is about a man's struggle to endow things or objects with meaning okay I'm giving you descriptions that are very vague on purpose because I don't want to ruin the entire moment for you you know these are very charged texts so uh, basically what you get from me is a, is a very basic description to, to just to share with you the ones that I liked the, the best so let's go with a little bit of analysis of the text here how would I describe the tropisms I have said this before of the novella so if you've seen my video uh, 12 brilliant novellas written by women you have heard this before but I want to go back to this even though it's a little bit cliche I think the each tropism is like a pebble thrown in a pond you know you throw that pebble the ripples expand and and those are you know the the re the resonance of the text and and you know the associations that that you have with it so that is the best that i can come up with they're really like pebbles thrown into a pond and something that i was thinking about uh, uh, you know as i was reading these texts it's, it's how difficult it is to produce a text like this it seems easy because you think okay it's one page two pages but remember it's you know an emotion a vivid impression and you turn that into a movement movement you know uh, very very difficult I actually tried my hand at it myself without even knowing about Natalie Sarot's tropisms when many years ago and the difficult thing about it is that I could not avoid including some sort of a punchline you know what I mean it's like there is no punchline to the tropisms but I could not avoid it. It's like I need to put something here, something that's interesting, something, some kind of a, you know, a punchline. That's not the way the tropisms work. So that was my mistake when I tried to to do that. And similar texts, right? I was thinking, what can I compare this to? Nothing really. I I, I have to be honest with you. I have not read anything like the tropisms, but some texts that are maybe uh, distant relatives would be Yasunari Kawabata's Palm of the Hand stories. You know, I, I know the, the connection here is, is not perfect. I would say, you know, the tropisms are more atomic than Kawabata's palm of the hand stories. I, I don't know if that makes any sense. Okay, if it doesn't make any sense, just let me know in the comments and I'll try to explain what I mean. But um, they're, they're more atomic. Other texts that I thought about were uh, Bolaños, Roberto Bolaños' Antwerp, which is also published in this series, The, the Pearls, The New Directions Pearls very disjointed texts but there is some kind of a connection between them okay there's also a little book by Amelia Gray her first book AMPM I hope you can see the, the cover from here it's also a collection of short shorts if you want to call them that short texts disjointed too but it's also a kind of a novel you know there, there is some sort of connection between the, the moments that these authors present uh, also, this is the case with a book that I really, really like. It is available in English, but not many people have read it, by the Peruvian writer Martin Adán, titled The Cardboard House, La Casa de Cartón. Once again, you have a novel of sorts put together with little moments, little vignettes, right? But again, these texts are more molecular than, than tropism. So I go back to my molecular versus atomic uh, thing or, or dichotomy here so I hope that makes sense uh, it would make sense if you read the book that's for sure because it's um, as I said before I cannot compare it to anything else because I have not really read anything like the tropisms before and in terms of emotions right emotions or feelings what kind of emotions feelings do we have here well there's uh, entrapment the need to escape right quiet desperation as I mentioned before ennui the idea of waiting, which is very dear to existentialist type of writers and even to the Nouveau Roman, uh, hypocrisy, right? so many, many different uh, feelings and emotions, but very oppressive ones, you know, very, very dark stuff that's going on below the, the surface uh, in the tropisms. So the bottom line, if you want something different, if you're tired of the 
contrived formulas of the traditional novel, then this little book is really for you. Okay, it's very brief, so even if you do not like it, you know, there is not a lot of time involved in reading this book. And actually, you know, I, I am sure that you're going to find something here that is worthwhile. I want to recommend this book to you as a reader, okay, but I also want to recommend it to you as a writer. If you happen to be a writer, you know, this I think will be a great source of inspiration for you. And you could you could have, you know, a very nice exercise trying to write tropisms. Maybe your narrative purposes or the texts that you like to write are completely different, but uh, maybe you can include tropisms into a larger text that you're producing or something, you know. So it, it, there are many, many possibilities here. It's a, it would be a really, really nice experiment to try. And before I finish the video, let me also share with you something about the edition, okay? And I'm going to assume that you're like me. Uh, you know how, how we book people are. We, we have our little preferences when it comes to the physical edition of the book. Uh, we all have our, our little book fetishes, if you, if you want to call it that. And this is the first uh, New Directions Pearl that I have. I had never bought anything uh, in this kind of a collection, okay? But listen to other titles that they have published under this collection. Uh, the Literary Conference by Cesar Aida. Have you read that? It's it's fantastic. It's really hilarious. Okay, it's a... Do I like Cesar Aida? I, I do, but with reservations. Okay, I, it's probably more to come about him in the future. But The Literary Conference is really one of the texts by him that I enjoyed the most. It's about a guy who wants to clone Carlos Fuentes. So you can imagine what that is like. Also, as I said before, Roberto Bolaño's Antwerp is included in this collection. You have Everything and Nothing by Jorge Luis Borges, Earn Burial by Sir Thomas Brown. So it's a very varied uh, collection. The Night Before Christmas by Gogol, Nikolai Gogol, Patriotism by Yukio Mishima, The Bridegroom Was a Dog by Yoko Tawada. I did not like that one, I'll be honest with you. Okay, I, I need to give Tawada another chance, but this one, The Bridegroom Was a Dog, I read it because it was there, basically, at the library, and I also knew that it had been awarded the Akutagawa Prize, but I read it and I was like, really? I don't know. I, I'm going to read more by her, because I, I always like to give you know authors, especially such important authors, another chance. And then one that I really, really liked is uh, Two Crocodiles, okay? And this one gathers two stories, one by Dostoevsky and the other one by Felisberto Hernandez, both about a crocodile of sorts, right? So that one is, a, I thought, was brilliant, you know, putting together these two stories by authors who apparently are very different, but who have many, many similarities when you actually get down to, you know, analyze the writings that they produced. So, those are my thoughts on Nathalie Sarot's tropisms. Have you read them? Do you have any recommendations on similar books to this one? Because I really liked it and I would like to read more in a similar vein. Any comments, any recommendations, any questions are always welcome, as you know. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for stopping by and have a wonderful day.